please welcome Programme Committee Chair, RSA Conference, Hugh Thompson. Everybody, hello, welcome, welcome to the last session of RSA Conference 2020. How's everybody feeling? All right, okay, good, enthusiastic response. Well, thanks so much for being here. Um, I know some of you have changed flights to be here on Friday for, you know, to watch the, uh, the magic and mystery of Penn and Teller, who are here in the house, by the way, just to let you know. Um, and I think you have chosen wisely. This is going to be an amazing, amazing show. Uh, and there's some concerning uh, items behind us in black cloth. I'm not quite sure what's going to happen. Uh, our insurance adjuster is a little worried about it too. Uh, but, but it'll be great. It'll be great. It'll be great. Okay. No fire, I was promised. Uh, but the, you know, if you look at, at RSA Conference 2020, we've really tried to focus it around this idea of the human element. And you've seen it everywhere, you've seen the posters, you've seen it as a theme in a lot of the talks. And it's one of the greatest unsolved mysteries, I would say, of the security space in a bunch of different ways. One is we need humanity, we need diversity of thought and views and perspectives to be able to deal with the security problem, that's one. And we've had a lot of sessions and workshops focused on that. We also, need to understand that our users are very diverse and have certain ways of thinking and we need to know how they're going to assess risk and look at a problem. But we also need to understand what our limitations are as people. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, somebody a long time ago handed me what was the best selling, I think, self-help book of all time. Some of you may have read it, How to Win Friends and Influence People. How many people have ever seen this book? Okay, I've seen it, some of you have seen it. Um, and you know, I'm reading this thing and I'm like, okay, oh, that's really interesting. It was written like 80 years ago or 80 plus years ago. I'm like, well, a little dated example's interesting. Okay, that's interesting. And it says things like, you know, always call people by their first name and you know, give sincere compliments. And I look at this, I'm like, this is a social engineering handbook. Right? <laughs> this, is, this is exactly what you should do in a phishing email, for example. And, and you, you look at this stuff, and what's amazing about it is that book is still as relevant today as it was 80 years ago, and it'll probably still be as relevant 80 years from now, because there are a set of call them zero days in people that on the one hand we love those zero days, on the other hand they're really, really difficult to fix. And we've all got those, but we've also got some unique ones that are specific to us. And to start off I'd love to share a uh, personal security story with you uh, related to one of my own. I I'd say one of my biggest weaknesses is puzzles. Like if somebody presents or hands me the most complicated, messed up puzzle I've ever seen, I just can't help but get into it, right? 72 hours, no sleep, you know, just, I, just, I just have to get it done. And I, I made the tragic mistake of having a conversation 10 years ago uh, with a colleague of mine. I was a professor at the time. And he mentioned to me, just really, really casually, like over lunch, hey, have you heard about this extreme couponing thing? Right? And I said, no, 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 I, 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 I haven't. And this is where I went wrong and said, can you tell me more about that? Right? <laughs> How many people here have, have experienced, heard of, or participated in extreme couponing, just out of curiosity. Okay, oh wow, even, a, even an actual yell uh, you know, of endorsement. So for, uh, for the uninitiated, um, you may be familiar with couponing in general, right? Those, you know, those coupons that you see in the newspaper, $3 off a tube of toothpaste type of thing if you bring it into the store. There is a whole cult around this thing called extreme couponing, which is taking that coupon, 
but then hunting for other places that have other coupons that intersect with that coupon that have unexpected consequences. Like, for example, imagine if you have a coupon that's like, okay, it, the, I'm going to give you 20% off a Listerine bottle, right? Good coupon to have, you know, especially in these times. And then you get another coupon that says $3 off a Listerine bottle. Now, if you combine those two coupons with a special that is currently going on at your favorite drug store or you know, f- you know, maybe a food store, you can get the cashier to give you, say, a dollar for taking that Listerine, right? It's like, it's unbelievable, right? And, and the concept of it was so intriguing. So I was, I, you know, I started to build these Excel models and, you know, <laughs> And, 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 and tabs, and then my, my PhD's in statistics, so I started to run these Monte Carlo simulations on if in this week's circular there's a crass coupon, I am set for life. Like the kids are you know, going to go. And so I, I prepared for um, my first, what's called the shopping trip in the nomenclature of uh, extreme couponing. And it's where you know, you've done all your prep, you've gathered all your coupons, you've checked the day to make sure it you know, intersects with all the coupons. You show up at the store and you buy the most concerning collection of things you've ever seen in your entire life. And uh, you know, this, the, the stuff that you buy on one trip uh, is called the haul, right? And I, I just want to show you a quick example. I think we have a picture of a, a hall, a typical hall, right? And you'll notice some eclectic items uh, in here, probably more uh, vitamins than you, you ever needed. You know, there's some, like a bag of reds, some really concerning stuff up at the top. And so when I went in uh, and did my first shopping trip, it was in New York and it was very cold, so I went to the Rite Aid that was you know, maybe two minutes away from where we were. Uh, and I bought, and let me see if I get this right, 25 bottles of women's facial hair remover, right? That was amazing coupons on that thing, unbelievable. 75 toothbrushes. 150 tubes of toothpaste because it was a combo coupon, which is very rare. You're going to run across that, treasure that coupon. And so I, I end up with all this of charcoal lighter and you know, crazy things. And so I get up to the counter, I pull out this massive stash of coupons. It's color coded. And the expression that the lady at the checkout gave me, I will never forget it. I will, I will really never forget it. So anyway, an hour and a half later, as we kind of like are checked out <laughs> of this thing, I, I take all the stuff, I take the shopping cart, and they let me borrow it, and said, you know, as long as you promise never to come back, and I, I brought the stuff back home, and I was so excited to show this stuff to my wife, right? Because, you know, I'm the, I'm the hunter-gatherer, and I've, you know, gone to the dangerous Rite Aid, and, you know, come back with all this stuff. And I'm laying it all out, and we're in a New York apartment, right? not known for its uh, spacious places to put stuff. And she looks at this stuff, and she's like, you can never touch a coupon again. <laughs> and that was, and that, 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 that was the end of it. And then we, we tried to give those things away, like instead of wine, when we went to people's uh, houses. And, <laughs> alienated a lot of people along the way. But, but, but the, point of it, the point of it is, you know, if somebody knew that about me, they would use the fact that I'm so compelled to solve a puzzle, they would use that as a way to get me. They would use that as a way to get me to click on something. They would use me to get, that, to get me to show up at an event. And it's these uniquenesses about us that on the one hand are so great, on the other hand, create opportunities for attackers to leverage. And that's what we're going to explore during this final session in a very unique way. So 
we've got Penn and Teller here, as I've mentioned, right? Magic, I think, is one of the ultimate manifestations of looking at these kinds of vulnerabilities and leveraging them. Uh, but we've also had some really, really bright people that have been studying this problem for a long time. And my first guest is one of the world's leading experts on the intersection of security and privacy and the human element. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lori Craner. Hey, Lori! How are you? I'm good. Thanks so much for coming. Thank Let's you. Have a seat. Oh, thanks for being here. Thank you. This is fun. And uh, I, I, I should have asked you this uh, backstage, and don't, don't read anything into it, uh, but I was asked to ask you if you would be open or have ever considered lying in a long box <laughs> and being sawed in half. Hmm. I, it could be completely unrelated to the show or that I, I just, but I promised I would. Yeah, that would be a new thing for me. Okay, all right, okay. <laughs> I'll take that as a hard maybe. Uh, yeah, so maybe. Th uh, so th thanks, thanks so much for being here. And I am such a big fan of yours. I've been reading your papers for a really, really long time. And you well, and I have been friends for a long well, thank time. You, thank and you, thank you, yeah. It's, uh, you know, I would argue some of the work that you've done is gonna set the foundation for the biggest problems that we face now in information security. And I, I wanted to ask you about some of the research, especially around passwords. Okay. So there's been a lot of discussion every year, I, I guess since the beginning of RSA conference about passwords and why do we still have them? And there's probably 3,000 vendors on the <laughs> show floor that will get rid of them for you uh, potentially. Uh, but you've done a lot of work on how people choose passwords and what is a good or bad password. And I'd wonder if you could share some of that with us and maybe some things that surprised you. Sure, yeah. Uh, I've been working with students and my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon on passwords for about 10 years now. And um, we've been very interested in how people choose passwords. And we do studies with users to, to see what they do. Uh, so one of the things that we do is we give people pairs of passwords and we ask them to tell us which one is better or are they basically the same. And uh, we, we've had some, some really interesting results here. Um, so, so maybe I can try with the audience? Yeah, go for all it, right. go for it. All yeah, right. yeah good, no, this good. is good. You know, uh, all right, well, yeah. well, you all are pretty smart. Um, so, so here's a pair of passwords. Uh, so one password is I love you 88, and the other password is I eat kale 88. Okay, so they, they both have the same number of lowercase letters and an 88 at the end. So we have to decide which one is better or are they equal. So raise your hands for I love you 88 is better. Okay, nobody's raising their hand. I, oh, no, I just no, like oh, oh, okay, I, I got like a few, more, I got I a few. Like, yeah. All right, I eat kale 88 is better. Okay, and they're equal. There are a lot of equals. OK, so when we do our user study, most people think they're equal because same number of lowercase letters, same 88 at the end. It turns out I eat kale 88 is way, way, way better, like 4 trillion times better. And the reason for that is that I love you is one of the most common passwords that people use. And I eat kale. Well, nobody eats kale. Like, wow, wow, jeez. And my kids don't, I eat kale, but my kids do not. And they're like, Mom, no one eats kale. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it surprises there's people. Lot, there's a lot of lessons you can take away from this, right? Like, uh, you know, on, one, on the one hand, it's a good sign for humanity that many people are choosing the I love you, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. passwords. But uh, it also reinforces what my mom has always said about, you know, hit your vegetables and they're good for you. <laughs> and, you know, I've never heard it expressed in passwords. But this, you know, that's interesting because it's not intuitive that one would be better than the no. other just because of, especially the way that current systems judge password strength, right? It tends to be this checklist of do you have upper and lower case? Is there a special symbol? You know, and so I, I, I'm curious. Okay, what else? What other ones have another you tried? One? Give okay. us another chance. Okay. Give us another chance. Okay, I'll what, give you what another you chance. What do you got? What do you got? All right, so we've got SpongeBob01. 
and Sponge 01 Bob. Okay. okay both, so, both beloved characters. Yeah, right? yeah. Same and character, same, same letter beloved, numbers. Yeah. Okay, so raise your hand for SpongeBob01 is better. Okay. Raise your hand for Sponge01 Bob is better. And raise your hand for they're the same. All right. So you all actually did pretty well on this one. Sponge01 Bob is by far better than SpongeBob01. And this is something that's not obvious to people who are not in the security field. The reason it's better is that most people put their numbers at the end of the password. So just by moving your numbers into the middle, you have a much stronger password. And the same thing goes for punctuation, capital letters, whatever. I can't believe you get to do stuff like this all day. <laughs> like, guys, which one's better, this one or this one? <laughs> well, let, let me ask you, you know, I know you've also done a lot of work on how people make good choices around security, specifically on IoT devices. Right? You've been working on this IoT labeling yeah. for a long time. What have you learned from that? Like, is it possible to communicate to the average person through something like a food nutrition label of how safe is a device? And do they even care? Yeah, yeah. So we've been designing uh, this IoT security and privacy label, and it, it looks like a, a nutrition label. Uh, and we've been testing it with people to find out whether it actually makes sense uh, to them. And you can, you can check this out on our website. It's iotsecurityprivacy.org. Um, so when we've done studies, we've shown people some of the ingredients on the label, and we've asked them whether they think that this, this particular item on the label makes the product more risky or less risky, and whether they'd be more likely to buy it or less likely to buy it. Uh, and what we've found is that for most of our ingredients, most people, when we ask them about risk, they, they actually are going in the right direction. They, they understand which things increase risk, which things decrease risk. Uh, so this, this is good. Um, but when we ask them whether it would increase their likelihood of purchasing, uh, we see that for some things, when risk is decreased, they are more likely to purchase, which is good. Um, but sometimes we don't see that. And one of the reasons we don't see that is people will say, well, I know it decreases risk, but it seems awfully inconvenient. Uh, so for example, if we say uh, this smart speaker has multi-factor authentication, they say, great, it decreases risk, but that's inconvenient, I won't buy it. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Right. So, and how does it vary based on the type of thing? Like I can imagine a smart speaker, although I would say that that's not a, not a good choice. <laughs> but is it different if it's a chainsaw versus, it's, you know, it's like the internet enabled chainsaw versus it's some innocuous, you know, thing yeah. like that. Do they... It does make a difference. We, okay, we have right. not That's tested good. chainsaws, but, but. Well, there, there is a market. There we, is a maybe market. we should. Yeah, we, we did, we did try smart, see, yes. smart toothbrushes, smart light bulbs, and uh, definitely like smart light bulbs raise fewer concerns for people than smart speakers, for example. And just that, I mean, Again, just out of curiosity, what would be the key things people are worried about on a smart toothbrush? <laughs> Only just because you brought up a smart toothbrush and I can't. Like... Well, we actually found that most people don't believe they actually exist. They do exist, they but do exist. people they do don't exist. believe it, and people don't understand what they should be worried about. Whereas I've actually seen these things, and um, they collect data about your brushing habits and your gum health, and they can actually wire it to your dental insurance company, uh -huh. which sounds kind of scary to me. If there's a breach of toothbrush data, <laughs> is that considered PII? Yeah, I think so. I don't, sorry, I just, I just like, <laughs> I, I okay, think, this one's just blowing my yeah, mind. Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> well, let, well let, 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 me ask you, let me ask you this. You know, it, it's hard enough for people to make good security and usability trade-offs with risk as it is. And it's something that you pointed out many times in your papers is that often it's people that don't want to do something malicious. It's just they want to get their work done, yeah. and maybe it's easier to get their work done through this thing that doesn't have a security control getting in the way. But I've got to ask you, you know, we're in a time where it is so easy for people to create artifacts that look so credible and so real. 
Like if you look at some of the deep fake video, deep fake audio that we've seen recently, do you think that it is possible for people to develop an immunity to that kind of stuff? Like how, how much at risk are we because these tools are now free and they're available and you, know, you can run a GAN on a, on a MacBook Pro for 10 hours and you get a pretty good fake video? Yeah, I, I think we, we definitely are at risk and it is hard for people to kind of take a step back and, and say, well, wait a minute, is this really real or not? And you don't even have to do anything as fancy as fake a video. I mean, we're faking emails in just plain text and people are falling for it. Thanks, SMTP. <laughs> Shout out to SMTP. No. Yeah, so, so I, th I think this is a difficult problem. Uh, and, and have you seen any of these indicators where just over time there really has been improvement in the populace? Like is there one type of scam that was horrible, a plague on <laughs> IT that we got immune to as a collective? I, Give me some hope. I'm looking for hope. Yeah, yeah. Well, well I, I think we keep seeing the same scams over and over again, but we are getting a bit better at looking out for just run-of-the-mill phishing attacks. I, I, think, I think people are getting better at detecting those. Okay. Moderate, <laughs> hope. Moderate <laughs> hope. Lori, thank you so All much. All right, thank really you. Really appreciate it. Thanks for being here. <laughs>